So hopefully this will kick us off into that, how can I get closer to God to find a, close, a better joy, a better love? So this time let us stand for a call to worship. Y'all keep making this too tall. <laughs> I don't grow that much. Let the earth tremble. Let us, sorry, let us call upon the name of the Lord. Amen. Let's continue standing and opening with number 292. What wondrous love is this? you may be seated. And our first scripture reading comes from, oh, we didn't put it in, do I need to go old school and get the Bible out? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Our first reading comes from 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. Beginning at the 20th verse. This is tiny print.
we beseech you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him then, we entreat you not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says at the acceptable time, I have listened to you and helped you on the day of salvation. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way through great endurances and afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, tumults, labors, watching, hunger, by purity, knowledge, forbearance, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, and as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. May God add his reading to the word. And so we come now to that time where we lift up any prayer requests this evening that we need to lift up. Yes. Hmm. No, we'll keep him in our prayers. We'll keep. That's it. Well, we'll keep them in our prayers. Yeah, and she's kind of young. Okay, we'll keep Nick in our prayers. Yes. So you and your wife, she's in surgery on the 28th. Yes, we will keep her in our prayers and that she heals wonderfully. And keep... We'll keep John Stroud. He's got a lot of swelling in his legs. And Ruth Singletary, she's just tired of being sick. She's had COVID for three weeks. She said, I was tested today, and it's, I'm not COVID positive anymore, but I'm still sick. And so they say, well, you don't have COVID, you don't have the flu. And she's like, well, what do I have? I'm sick. I'm, like, tired of it. So keep her in her prayers.
Yeah. Yes. Amen. Thank you for that, Mark. Well, let us pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, as we come here this morning, this evening, Marilyn told me not to say that. But Lord, you know our, our hearts. You know our desires. And you know our failures. But Lord, we come here this evening to be closer with you, to begin a time of just remembering that love, remembering that wonderful act of Good Friday and the joy of Easter morning that you offer us life, that you are, have the words of life, that you bring hope and power to our lives. You bring purpose to our lives. You bring everything to our lives that we need. And so we just want to honor you. We want to walk closer with you. We want to know your ways, your will, your love. And so, Lord, as we begin this Lenten season, speak to us. Speak to us once again your words of hope, your words of life. because we want to live into them. And even as we gather here, Lord, seeking to be closer to you, we also pause to remember there are those that are hurting and the pain is keeping them from you. The sickness and disease is, is keeping them at bay from living life to the fullest. So, Lord, you've heard the many requests that we have named before you this day. You know the needs of each person each request. And so we lift them up to you, Lord, for restoration, for healing, for strength. And not only these that we have named before you, Lord, but for those on our prayer list. We even now lift up to you that one name, that one request that is silent in our heart that we name before you now. And gracious Heavenly Father, during this Lenten season, bless this church. Bless this congregation. Bless the work we do. Bless our outreach, Lord. Open our eyes to the needs around us. Because, Lord, as each person from this congregation goes about their day, they're interacting with so many people. Let us not pass them by. Let us not be in such a hurry that we miss saying a good word to somebody, a word of hope. So Lord, slow us down sometimes so that we can be your instruments. Use us for your purposes. And we thank you for the precious gift of Jesus Christ who died our death and rose again to offer us eternal life and who taught us to pray the prayer we now pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Continue singing, please, with number 402, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian.
Second scripture comes from the Gospel of Luke, the 23rd chapter, beginning the 32nd verse. Hear now these words. Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there, with the criminals one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching, but the elders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you were the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, if you ever have you find yourself having to be told, grab a Bible and turn to a particular verse, do you know how the Bible's ordered in the New Testament? You begin with the Gospels, then you have the book of Acts, then you have Paul's letters, and Paul's letters have an interesting order to them. Do you know what the thread is in the order of Paul's epistles? It's this great theological thought. The longest one is first, the second longest one is second, the third longest one is third, all the way down to his single page letters. So if you're thinking you got Corinthians and Romans, you know they're going to be up closer to Acts. If you got Philippians, Galatians, Ephesians, they're going to be in the middle of that. And if you get down to his short letters, they're going to be at the end. And then you got the others. But Paul's letters are ordered by their length. Well, during Lent, I'm going to be looking at the last sayings of Christ. And when one looks at the four Gospels, we find that Christ made seven statements. But no one Gospel writer put all seven in their Gospel. They wrote the ones that meant something to them, that helped them to share their Gospel. And that's the thing about God's Word is, it's so wonderful. It speaks to us, and it'll speak to this person differently than this person than that person. But essentially, these were Christ's last words, his last teaching, that last bit of making sure all was in place before he died. And down through the people, history, people have put a lot into people's last words. Some are statements of works, such as Caesar Augustus' last word to the people, Behold, I found Rome of clay and leave her to you of marble. Or statements of standing pride in one's belongings, such as uttered by private first-class Edward H. Abrams, who single-handedly held off a group of Japanese soldiers who tried to infiltrate the Allied lines one night. He was found shot up at his post, surrounded by a number of Japanese he had killed. The officer who found him that night and came to him Private First Class Aaron said, they tried to come over me last night. I guess they didn't know I was a Marine. He died just after saying that. But some have been tried to be more humorous. For those who grew up with Laurel and Hardy, and remember who they are, when Stan Hardy was about to die, he told his nurse, I'd rather be skiing. The nurse asked, oh, are you a skier? Mr. Laurel, he said, no, but I'd rather be doing anything else than have these needles stuck in me. And a few minutes later, he died. Well, this evening, we heard Jesus' first statement he made as he was being crucified. He was stretched out on the cross, on the ground, probably being held and pulled as a Roman soldier took a hammer and nailed it to his hands and feet. And as this was going on, Luke tells us that Jesus prayed for that soldier, for the people there, for all who had a hand in his death, as he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. When you look at this statement, it contains two very interesting points. 
And I'll start with the second point, the second half. They do not know what they are doing. Well, they knew exactly what they were doing. This event was planned carefully. It was well thought out. There was a planned betrayal by one of Jesus' insiders. There were false witnesses to be found. There was not one but multiple questionings of Jesus. He was brought before multiple people who could have freed him, but didn't. This was a deliberate act by so many, and yet Jesus says they do not know what they are doing. So what does he mean? Well, in making that statement, Jesus is saying, first and foremost, I am still in control. They think they are killing me. But they're not. Jesus is saying that evil people are not in control of this world, even though it may look like it at times. It may look like they are in control, but they're not. God is at work in all things working out his perfect plan. Jesus is saying that he is not being killed by the, these people, but that he is willingly laying down his life for us. In John 10, we, when Jesus was teaching the people that he was the good shepherd and that the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep, he said this about his life. I laid down my life for the sheep. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me because I laid down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. Jesus was in full control as he lay his life, laid down his life. He freely went to the cross. No matter how much others thought they had planned this, they had orchestrated it, it was a, everything coming together, they didn't plan it. It was Jesus who allowed it to happen. And it needed to happen. It needed to happen so that our sins could be forgiven, so that we might find life today. We see this concept in the Old Testament too. You remember the story of the 12 sons of Jacob who would become the 12 tribes of Israel and how Joseph was hated by most of his brothers that they almost killed him. That was their plan. They were going to kill him and then they decided to sell him into slavery. But God was with Joseph and allowed him to rise up and become the second in command of all of Egypt. And now had his 11 brothers kneeling at his feet in fear that they were about to be killed by him, even though they didn't recognize him. It was then that Joseph revealed himself as their brother and welcomed them. And this is what he told his brothers. Do not be afraid. I am in the place of God. Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. I think we go through life thinking that there are times that it looks like evil is triumphing or evil is being blessed or evil is getting its way. But Jesus reminds us on the cross that God is always in control and that God's plans of salvation cannot be thwarted. Only we can separate ourselves from that salvation. It's there for our choosing. And when we reject it, we reject God's forgiveness for us. And see, that's the first part of this statement. Father, forgive them. Forgiveness is an essential to Christ's promise, his purpose here, to reconcile us to God. It begins with forgiveness. And as we go through this Lenten season, we must think about where do I need to be forgiven and who do I need to forgive? And we can do that. We can forgive others and we can accept other people's forgiveness because it begins with God has already forgiven us. And thus, we can be 
people who live forgiven lives, forgiving people. In fact, if you want to think about how important forgiveness is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the three Gospels that really center on Christ's teaching, the word forgive, forgiven, or forgiveness appears 42 different times, all associated with sayings of Christ, where love only appears 26 times, which means we cannot love if we cannot forgive. And we cannot live if we cannot forgive. We cannot find the ultimate peace if we cannot forgive. It's that important. Forgiveness is the foundation of everything we do. And sometimes we have to forgive over and over again. Peter asked Christ, how many times must I forgive? He thought seven was enough. But Christ told him not seven, but 70 times seven, <clears throat> which is a way of saying infinity. It was perfection times perfection. And when we look at this statement by Christ, we see that this prayer was not uttered just once. It's, not, it's only written that it was only uttered once, but you almost can envision Christ saying this over and over again. When Luke says, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, the word, Greek word for said is in the imperfect tense, which means which means that another way of saying that was that Jesus said again and again, Father, forgive them. But the verb tells us he was repeating it. Robert G. Lee in a book shares what his concept of this might have been. He says, imagine it as the centurion crushed him to the ground. We hear that same prayer. As the blunt spikes tore through his quivering palm, the same prayer. When they reared up the cross, made heavier to lift by the weight of his body, the same prayer. When the rabble cursed and ranted, the same prayer. When the soldiers parted his garments and gambled for his seamless robe, the same prayer. When the curious crowds wagged their heads, the same prayer. He writes, oh, how many times that prayer pierced heaven's blue that day, no one knows. It was not an ejaculated petition shot into heaven in a moment of mercy. Rather, was Jesus repeatedly storming the throne of grace with a barrage of burning appeal. Jesus kept on saying, Father, forgive them. That's how much he loves us. It's a wonderful image that God is our counselor, the one who stands by us before God and says, Father, forgive that one. Matthew 5, through 46, Christ taught us to love our enemies. Well, to do this, we must forgive the wrongs of our enemies that they commit against us. Again, in Luke 6, 28, we read that Christ tells us to bless those that curse you. The statement on the cross was a living example of that teaching. Christ came to reconcile us to God. Christ took on our sins and asked God to forgive us as being sinless. If we cannot forgive, I suspect it may be because we have not accepted the forgiveness of God that he granted us. We need to learn to accept it, but we need to learn people who forgive. It's interesting, we said the Lord's Prayer just a little while ago. There's one conditional prayer in that prayer. When you say it, we always say, Father, forgive as we have forgiven. We say that sometimes so ghibli and just in passing that we really don't think about what we're asking God to do to forgive us as we forgive others. It's something to think about. See, to be able to forgive, you must believe that your own sins have been forgiven, that there's nothing in this world that anybody can do to you to separate you from God's love. There's no harm anybody can do to you. There's nothing they can do to make you feel bad. There's nothing they can do to offend you because you and God are one, because he has forgiven you. Know that you are completely forgiven and accept this wonderful grace. Let us pray. Grace Heavenly Father, we thank you that you 
you forgive us. Lord, there are times that we can't forgive ourselves, let alone others. So help us, Lord, to hear your words that we are forgiven. Help us not only to hear them, but to know them, to experience them, to live them, to be freed by them, to find the joy in them, to find life in them. Let each one here today know that power that they are forgiven. We pray this in your son's most precious holy name. Amen. And so, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the early Christians observed with great devotion the days of our Lord's passion and resurrection. And it became a custom of the church that before the Easter celebration, there should be a 40-day season of spiritual preparation. During this season, converts to the faith were prepared for holy baptism. It was also a time when persons who had committed serious sins and had separated themselves from the community of faith were reconciled by penitence of forgiveness, and they were restored to participation in the life of the church. In this way, the whole congregation was reminded of the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the need we all have to renew our faith. So I invite you, therefore, in the name of the church, to observe a holy Lent by self-examination and repentance, by prayer, fasting, and self-denial, and by reading and meditating on God's word, to make a right beginning of repentance. And as a mark of our mortal nature, let us now bow before our creator and redeemer for a moment of silence, and then we will pray. Almighty God, you have created us out of the dust of the earth. Lord, we ask you that make these ashes be to us a sign of our mortality and penitence so that we may remember that only by your gracious gift are we given everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And so at this time, I invite you to come forward as you feel led to receive the ashes. If you cut a lot of hair down, just kind of pull it up and I can get to the forehead. But you're invited to come now.
At this time, I invite you to stand as we close in song, Just As I Am, number 357. And as you leave tonight, let us reach up and grab God's hand because he's reaching down a forgiving hand to you. And he's grabbing your hand and says, I love you. I sent my son to die for you. And I forgive you. So go in that power. Go knowing that you are forgiven. And go live forgiven lives. Amen.